Can I just say how much I love and appreciate all of you? For one thing, we're growing like crazy. I've only been uploading to this channel for two weeks, and I only have like three videos where I actually talk about computers, and we're already over 500 subscribers and counting. But more than that, you've all been incredibly helpful and just so nice in the comments, which is what I want to focus on today. In my current videos, I've made some mistakes and forgotten some important details that you have all done a fantastic job of letting me know about in the comments. So let's get into it. I'm Michael Kratiger, welcome to MK Computing. Let's start with what I think is the most important thing for me to address, the mistakes I've made. Now, if this is your first video of mine, welcome. And I'm currently doing a challenge where I can only use Linux for a month. And if I use Windows at all, I have to delete this channel and my other channel where I focus on horror. So far, I have covered making the switch, creating videos and thumbnails, and gaming. My gaming video is where I made the most mistakes. My biggest one being when I said this. On Windows, .exe means it's an executable, which is just computer speak for program. For me, I'm running a Debian-based distro, and all you need to know about that for the purposes of this discussion is that my programs will be in a .deb, which means Debian package. That is not correct. Something I didn't know before starting this challenge is that the way Linux handles its files is way different than it is on Windows. What I said about Windows is true. It uses dot something to distinguish what type of file it is, and you most commonly see it on programs like games and software. Where I made my mistake is calling .deb a program. A .deb file is known as a software package file. Software package files contain necessary files and a checklist of required dependencies needed to install the desired software, but it is not the software itself. A lot of people in the comments liken it much closer to a .msi file on Windows. On top of that, it's not a Debian specific file. .debs are Debian software packages, but you can open them in other distros as well using something called DPKG. DPKG, putting it simply, is the package manager for Debian software packages. So I am sorry I got that wrong. My thought process behind making this claim was, hey, this installer on Windows is a .exe, and when I run this file on Linux, it also seems to install a program. .deb must be the Debian equivalent of .exe, which is not the case and I should have looked further into it before making that claim. Moving on, when I was talking about setting up Steam for Linux, I said to do this. After downloading and installing Steam, I recommend you get on the Steam beta update. This will ensure that Steam has the latest and greatest changes from Valve to keep you gaming. Yeah, don't, don't, don't do that. Some of you have reported running into issues when using the Steam beta update, and that it's generally very buggy and full of problems. Not only that, but switching to the Steam beta update gives you no added benefit with regard to Proton. Valve updates Proton independently from Steam itself. All switching the beta update does is put you on the beta for Steam's user interface, putting you on all the experimental changes to how Steam looks and feels. Which, thinking about it, makes sense why it's in the interface tab in Steam settings. Look, hindsight's 2020, and I need glasses, so... <laughs> I thought I remember watching tutorials on setting up Steam back when I was first learning about Linux, where they recommended getting on the Steam beta update. So, it's just something I've always done when setting up a new Linux installation. But looking back on it, I probably just misunderstood what they were talking about, and just got lucky that I never ran into any major issues. But yeah, don't do it. Next up is regarding a couple statements I made about anti-cheat software. Easy Anti-Cheat is pretty much what it sounds like. It's a system in multiplayer games that scans for any kind of cheating software that a player might run for that game. Now, Easy Anti-Cheat overall is a good thing. Gaming on Linux has gotten a lot better. Most games that aren't VR and don't have asshole companies behind them that just refuse to flip a switch and support Linux run perfectly. Some of you were saying that the claim anti-cheat is overall good is a sentiment that not everyone agrees with, and you are correct. Not just regarding Linux, but as a whole. So I decided to look into it. People's main problems with anti-cheat software seems to be that some run on the kernel level. Now, what does that mean? First, let me explain what a kernel is. The kernel is the part of your operating system with the most power over everything. It acts as the bridge between your computer software and its hardware. It basically goes like this. Every program you use on your computer needs a certain amount of resources to actually run. 
they need enough RAM, processing power from your CPU, access to your hard drive if they're reading or writing data from it, stuff like that. And they need to communicate with your computer for use of these resources. But they don't just get to go and take whatever resources they need. That's where the kernel steps in. Say you want to run a game. That game has to talk to the kernel and ask for the resources it needs. The kernel then properly distributes those resources to the game and, in addition, wherever else they're needed. So, as you might be able to guess, your OS's kernel is pretty much the highest authority on your entire system. And where the problem comes in is that some anti-cheat softwares operate at the same level of authority as your kernel. This is why some multiplayer games that have anti-cheats still don't run on Linux systems, even with the use of a compatibility layer like Proton. Even with Proton allowing the game to properly communicate with the system, the anti-cheat software supersedes all of that sees that you're not running on a supported operating system, and prevents the game from actually running. Now, in my research, I didn't really find people running into issues with anti-cheat software itself, uh, outside the occasional mistaking of a normal computer driver for some kind of cheating device, and then banning the user for it. The real danger, and what people seem to be afraid of, is what if a program hacks into that anti-cheat software and uses it to bypass your computer's antivirus and infect your computer with some kind of virus or spyware without you knowing? Since anti-cheat is given such a high level permission, it goes unchecked by any virus protection software because it has a higher authority than your antivirus. Which I actually did find an example of. Someone was able to use the same anti-cheat driver that Genshin Impact uses to infect people's computers with a virus. So, to amend my statement, anti-cheat software is definitely something to be cautious of if it runs on the kernel level. Now, as far as Linux support in anti-cheat software being able to just be turned on and off with a switch, that's only half true. Steam did work with Epic Games to make implementing Linux support in easy anti-cheat software as easy as enabling a few checkboxes, but only for the EOS version of easy anti-cheat. Apparently, Easy Anti-Cheat has two versions, non-EOS and EOS, uh, EOS standing for Epic Online Services. A lot of games seem to use the non-EOS version, which is supposedly a lot harder and may require the need to log into a separate Epic account, something that PC gamers are clearly against. Oh, by the way, this only pertains to Easy Anti-Cheat and not other anti-cheat systems. So, no, it's not just a few clicks for every anti-cheat game to enable Linux support. Oh, by the way, I'll be leaving all the sources for what I found linked in the description. So, that about does it for our mistakes. It, I think. At least for, you know, my videos. Next, I want to mention a few things I forgot and some stuff to clear up. To start, the very first thing you want to do when freshly installing a new Linux distro is to do any available updates. On a Debian-based distro, like I'm using, you can use sudo apt update in the terminal, followed by sudo apt upgrade. This ensures that all your included software and dependencies are up to date and ready to go. I always do this when installing a new distro, but I fail to recommend doing so in any of my videos, so thank you for reminding me about it. If you're curious about if a Steam game you want to run works on Linux, a great place to check before downloading it or spending any money on it is ProtonDB. It's also a great place to look if you're having any issues with a particular game. ProtonDB is an amazing resource and I can't believe I completely forgot to mention it. And I didn't know about it before starting this challenge, but there's also a very similar site for checking if a game with an easy anti-cheat system will work on Linux called Are We Anti-Cheat Yet? Next, I want to clear something up about my problem with the directories on DaVinci Resolve. I mentioned that I couldn't set up my external hard drive, which is where I keep all of my recorded and edited footage, as a destination for my edited video to go after it finished rendering. However, what prevents me from doing so, and this is completely my fault by the way, I didn't do a good enough job explaining what the issue was, is not that I can't find my external hard drive's file location, but that DaVinci doesn't seem to let me browse my files in order to pick where the rendered footage ends up. In the drop-down menu, it gives me the directory for my videos folder, and I click on that to see something called camera, clicking on that gives me these three long strings of text, and clicking on those does nothing. It only lets me select my video folder in my home directory with seemingly no way to properly browse my file system. But this doesn't really bother me, because I can just have the folder containing all the clips and stuff I need open on my second monitor and drag and drop everything I need into DaVinci. Okay, now I want to get into some super helpful stuff that you guys mentioned that I didn't know about before starting this challenge. First, 
converting my videos into a format that DaVinci supports. I talked about how there's this big long command you can use to convert the video over to something that DaVinci can use and that it took forever to do so. And then you absolute geniuses were like, hey, you don't need to convert the video if it works in DaVinci, just convert the audio, which is what this command does. It's still a pretty long command, but it does do the job quicker. But you don't have to worry about how long the command is if you just use an amazing program you guys recommended, Handbrake. You just select the video you want, tell it you want the audio to be in a different file format, and hit go. Simple. Next, in my first video in the series, I explained how some websites don't let you download from or use them just because you're running Linux. But you can actually get around this by changing your browser's user agent. Now, all you need to know about a user agent for our purposes is that it identifies to websites what operating system you're using. In Chrome, which is the browser that I use, you can change your user agent to make it look like you're using a completely different operating system. Just go to the three dots in the top right corner, go to more tools, developer tools, network conditions, and uncheck use browser default. Then you can choose what user agent you want to use. I was able to download DuckDuckGo this way. Important to note though that it doesn't work for every website. I still can't watch anything on Peacock doing this. Someone recommended that I put my PC specs in the description of my video so people can see what hardware I'm running, which is a fantastic idea. So from now on in the description of my video, you'll find my PC specs. And the last thing I want to bring up is... What the hell is Super Tux Cart? Okay, this is actually pretty fun. And that's about all I want to cover in this video. I want to thank you all for your kind words and for being really good about telling me when I'm wrong or if there's a better way I could be doing something. I know a fair bit about computers and I've used Linux off and on for a few years now, but I'm by no means an expert in any of this. I really do have an awesome community. Pretty much all of you were super respectful when telling me that I got something wrong and it felt like you genuinely wanted to help me and I appreciate that so much. Quick little announcement, I'm actually going on vacation this week so I won't be responding to comments as much as I have been, but I promise to get to all of you when I get back. If I got anything wrong in this video, please let me know. Thank you for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.